watch them and listen to them. And this session is called Reverberations, Poetry in English. So please switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent. We would appreciate complete silence so we can focus on what they're saying. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the session. Our moderator, okay, there will be a question and answer session at the end. Um, our moderator this session is Salman Qureshi, English language poet and, and columnist whose pieces have been published in the Pakistan, in the annual Pakistan Journal of Literature. Please enjoy. Hello, can I, is this clear? Can everybody hear it? Is okay? Hmm? Yeah. Hello, can everybody hear me? Oh, fine, thanks, it's working. So, uh, we start, this here is KLF, our English poetry reading. <laughs> poetry is, um, people have imagined poets to be very refined people. Let's not forget that poetry is certainly the oldest of the literary forms and possibly, along with dance, the oldest literary form, the oldest art form of any kind, going back to man's most primitive origins, and that poetry was there. It's accompanied man throughout his, mankind throughout history. And so poetry and music are closely related, I think, in my view. Poetry and prose are not, not directly anyhow. They both use words, but they use words for different purposes. Prose uses it for narrative or information. Poetry uses it for poetry. Uses words and language for poetry, which is why they say poem poetry is difficult to translate. I don't entirely agree because some of the greatest poetry in the world has been translated into most of the languages. I think of Shakespeare, I think of Neruda, who have been translated into hundreds of languages, and of course, all the great religious works uh, are in poetry. Uh, but however, having said that, come to our gathering today, we have a number of voices of very different kinds. Uh, we have poetry, we have prose poetry, some performance poetry, and, uh, well, different ways, different subjects, different forms of expression, from different individuals. The key issue though, to my mind, not the issue, but the point about today is, we have poets, some poets who are very young. We have some who are, <clears throat> well, not so young anymore. And then we have those whom we euphemistically call senior citizens, like myself. So to make a start, I am going to take advantage of my uh, position here, although by reading a poem of my own first, which in a way touches on this issue of age groups. So I'll take permission to read this uh, poem, one poem called Poem at Year's End. So this poem is Poem at Year's End by Salman Tariq Qureshi, who has been just introduced. Unease at evening and last night's clarity of stars heralded this prism shift of morning sunlight. The altered breeze grown keener, drier, gathers away brine sodden curtains of sea mist, ushered at last by ship's horns to our south. Winter commences its rearrangements. 
In this suburban garden, the waxen sheen of magnolia flakes to dullness. Green creepers against brick red walls blanch in the paler light. Our shadows and those intersecting grow longer, nor disappear at noonday. <clears throat> we resolve this to be a time for alterations. Before the unease of ever deepening twilights becomes a starless tossing in unmapped darkness. But the seaward flowing air now chills too sharply at the bone. Brine and crusts rusted anchors. Tendrils of sea anemones festoon the rigging, the roots. The roots. Tendrils of sea anemones festoon the rigging, the roots riddle, riddling, th riddling through the, the hull plates, crumbling the masts. Salt stings within the veins. Not trade winds nor monsoon corridors drive to such shipwrecks. Only the count of too many winters. Rocks by a garden pond and a single unseasonal dragonfly. Patterns of intersecting shadow beneath blades of grass. The last wilting lily. Land anchored, our eyes search leeward of horizons only for shifts of sunlight squinted at differently. Voyage enough now to steer into the changing winds of another year, into another passage of the seasons. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to call a poet who's uh, new to this particular festival. Uh, this is Sofia Khan. Sofia Khan is a poet from Karachi. She holds a BA in English. And she's teaching English literature and history at St. Joseph's Con Convent School here in Karachi. Sofia. Hello, good evening. I'll be reading three poems for you tonight. Uh, the first one is titled Stillness in Song. When the river water runs a jeweled emerald, larks will reunite in song with each strum of sleepy sitar. Plush peonies brushing against each other, competing for first bloom, as if to say there is still much left to fight for in the windy days to come, with no rain, no roads, no time for respite. Perhaps this will welcome sweet, opportune spring to hoist our spirits, our souls as high as the wind will take them, carrying them to the one who sits, nestled between puffed clouds, 
their string of beads, click, click, clicking. A centuries-old tree withers and crumbles. A sick sun regains consciousness. A mirror cracks from all sides. A moment of peace. The next one is a blurred sonnet. of sculptures and masks, not the shabby sofa assortments from yesteryear acquired somewhat suspiciously, decked with flowers, wrapped in sheets to rest with the sinking sun, safe from the shadow's lair. And then there's love poem. Open, fossilizing me in your willow embrace, an embedded fragment, a part of me that lives in you. I trace your palm lines, your re Weeping, close to letting the amber sap run dry. I will root you, cradle you, till we see our days of blossom joy. Thank you. Sophia, Sophia one minute. I was going to say your first poem that you read just now. This particular, I mean, I loved this line, frankly. Um, as if to say there's still so much so left to fight for. In the windy days to come, with no rain, no roads, no time for respite. And sweet, opportune spring to what? Perhaps this will welcome sweet. Now, you moved here from nature poem, which I personally love, nature poem. But uh, uh, the other two are more personal utterances. But so which, <laughs> what do you think is nature? of nature as a subject for poetry, do you think we, uh, should it be the primary subject or not? Well, I think for a, a poet or humans in general, nature is, is as in, inane to us as anything else, you know. It's one of the first things that is introduced to us, you know, the world that we live in. So it, it felt very natural to write about that. And I feel that nature is also very um, connected to the divine, in a sense. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Right, I'm now going to ask, uh, we're still in the uh, youth phase, another young lady, Mina Shahzad. She has read here before. Mina, she's currently doing her O-levels at Cedar College. Uh, she writes poetry and short stories. She believes that she writes because she is bad at remembering and just wants to capture memories and feelings into words. Mina. Hello, how is everyone? I hope you're all doing well today. I had the privilege of being invited here last year through my English teacher, who's also here today, Ms. Ermina. Hello, Miss. <laughs> and uh, somehow I got invited again this year, and I'm very happy to be here. Last year I had one poem. This year I was invited to read three. So you're going to have to bear with me a little longer this time. <laughs> so the first one, I read a lot. I wrote this after reading a story in which these uh, childhood friends reconnect many years later as lovers. And it was a very cute story, so I wrote a poem about it. It's called Marigold. I saw you in the marigolds near my grandmother's house.
I love you like an old friend who smiles bright with eyes like growing crescent moons for a kiss given before goodbyes that made me speak in tunes. I want to build something with you in this strange, sad world, even if a baseless nothing, dreams, hopes, and plans were. This second one is called Madness. I'm a student of A-level literature, and currently we're studying King Lear, which is a really good play, and it really inspired me. So this is the other one. Take power away from a man. The father from the king, the man from the madness, the human from the crown. Take away a man's crown and you leave him a husk. But take away a man and yet the crown remains the crown, bright and golden forevermore. Take away the man and there remains a shadow. There was none of substance to begin with, none of remembrance or worth. Take away the king and take away the power. You never deserved it anyway. That was dark, but I had a lot of fun writing that poem. The last one is a more wholesome one. I wrote this because I realized that I have had the privilege of having good friends. The spark of a smile, the strength of a storm, and the love of all things bright and lovely and wonderful. I am your friend, and you are mine. Thank you. Thank you, Vinna. Uh, uh, thank you. I find actually a surprising degree of maturity of expression in your work. To, for one so young. So to move on, we have with us, we were going to have with us um, Jiva Harun. Jiva unfortunately fell very ill two days ago. He's in hospital. And um, just but I need to talk about him a little. And I will, in a moment, read one or two of his poems, or two or three of them. He uh, is a lawyer by profession, barrister, and um, he is, uh, at the moment, legal manager at uh, an organization. The point is, he is Malaysian in origin, of uh, Tamil origin, and um, but he moved to Pakistan many years ago. He met his wife. Shirin Harun, who was, they were studying law together in England, and so he moved to Pakistan and changed his religion in, and name in order to uh, be with her. Jiva, unfortunately, uh, has not been, is, not, is ill and could not come, but I will take the opportunity. I think I'd like to share 
a couple of his poems with you. Allow me. There's a, <clears throat> there's a kind of tenuous, evanescent quality about his work, which is interesting. This one is called Spectre. Laughter in the dark, a, pri a private jest. This one, which is called Rivulet's Redux by Jeeva Harun. The first drip. Words may be ordered, borrowed, charged by the scat. Survived. Millennial. Babylon, Babylon and Samaria are no more, but renewal we seek has no place left to hide. And this third one of his, you know, this dry air, air is a little difficult. The third one of us is, is called Recall. or maybe not at all. On behalf of Jiva, thank you.
I'm not going to ask, okay, as we said, this poetry and this prose poetry. Free verse and prose poetry are different. And next poet I'm going to ask, Mahashmi writes both, but I think she's a stronger field for prose poetry. So, Maha is a student of Karachi Grammar School. And um, she studies literature, literature during her A-levels. But Mahashmi. Hello everyone, my name is Maha and today I'll be reading out four of my poems. This is actually my first time ever performing my own poetry. One thing about my work is that it's not titled, it's numbered. So here goes. The attic, under a bed, a closed closet, everywhere a man's anger can hide. In the crevices between bricks, in feeling faint, it and they should. If I close my eyes, there are homes in all the worlds that don't exist. In another dimension, the clocks turn backwards. Time runs in reverse. I pick up broken shards and place a glass on the table. They take my grandmother's body out of the grave. The nurse pulls a tube out of her body and the ambulance sirens rush her back home. In another dimension, I learn to love and mean it. In another dimension, I mother my grief the way I wish I'd been raised. In another dimension, my heart was never broken. In another dimension, you're not a different person when you don't care. In another dimension, you still hold my heart in both your hands. The clock turns backwards. Matriarchal futures inch their way out of the attic, unwrapping their way out of the sheets of dust-ridden plastic. The clock turns backwards. A gun is shoved out from underneath the bed. The clock turns backwards. We take our ghosts out of locked closets and promise to love them. In another dimension, where the clock turns backwards, we promise to love our ghosts and my parents unlock the door to our glass house. People will love you if you let them, I've learned. Here's the second one. I try to write Old and wrinkled, soft, like the hand I'm holding. Like the hair on your head, gray, dyed brown. It comes out, Urdu speaking, homemaking, glasses angled behind newspaper to cut out bedtime stories for me. Unapologetically loving, doctors shaking their heads. A half-painted jar of flowers pushed behind rows of pill bottles. It comes out accepting defeat more respectfully than I would have liked. Unapologetically understanding, it comes out. Particularly strong by my thoughts. Better go on. Don't mind me. Slather the emptiness like a whisper, like smoke so densely still and unmoving. Keep your finger there as long as. Close your eyes like you've cried tears of honey, and your eyelids cannot come undone at even your strongest whim.
doesn't run through. You must let the blood run cold. You must put someone else's mask on first. You must let your bones make up for all their empty parts. You must do so by giving out more than you could receive. You must look to your right and your left before putting your mask on. It's like riding a bike. Um, a little bit of background from my last poem. This is my last year of school and as I look around and I see my friends and I spend my last days with them, this is a sort of memoir for the years that we've spent together. The economics textbook says, the law of diminishing marginal utility means having one more of something makes it less valuable. Places we say we want to apply means that one day, close enough to imagine, we'll be meeting, seeing the friends we grew up with for the last time in years, that we won't know what to say. After all, what do you say when you're losing someone that's still alive? That we'll carry the thought of the people that we happen to be put in a classroom with on the first day of seventh grade for the rest of our lives. That not so far from now, we'll be on an airplane and it'll be nighttime, and everything's going to be so dark, it'll feel like you're the only one sitting there. And your entire life is at home, God knows how many hours away. That sitting on that plane means we'll be home for... get even a little less valuable. Thank you, Ma. We were going to have Pirzada Salman next. Pirzada is... Uh, Unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, good for him. Less for us, he is also an Urdu poet. And uh, right now, he is, at this point, moderating a session of poetry himself. Uh, uh, down the way. So, so, we have to... If he had started earlier, he could have joined us, but unfortunately, he can't. I'm going to move on to... Uh, Zarmina Raza. <laughs> Zarmina teaches literature at Cedar, Eden, Karachi Grammar, and Links, and is on the AKU IED blog editorial board. She has started two weekly readings and writing meetups to foster creativity and connections during the COVID times. Poetry in the Park. And uh, what is it? Inked conversations, an online group for adults. Last year, she co edited and contributed to Inked Conversations, an anthology. She writes poetry and creative nonfiction and paints abstracts with acrylic and ink. Were you a student of my wife at any point? I was for one year, but I was really bad. <laughs> Anyhow, Zermina yes. Reza. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, my first poem is called Locked Doors. Key in hand, I stand at the door. Eyes closed, I rest my forehead against the wood and wait. I wait to hear the familiar voice cry out. 
Wait, wait, so impatient. Sabar karo. I wait for the lock to click and the knob to turn. Forget your key again. Why don't you ever remember to take it? I wait for the familiar shuffle. I wait for the irritable mumble, for the waft of musk, for the piercing whistle of the hearing aid. I want to be let in. Full five minutes pass, and I stand waiting with a key in hand. I had not forgotten the key this day, nor during the 10 days past. I will not forget it tomorrow, or tomorrow, or tomorrow, or tomorrow to come. Forgetting was no longer a luxury. Forgetting was no longer so easy. Trouble was, I just couldn't seem to forget. So I stand outside the door with a key in hand, waiting for the lock to click and the grumblings of a man who has gone. I lift my head, draw in a breath, and turn the knob. It's locked. I stand at the door, key in hand, and wait. The second poem is pristine. was perfect moments ago. Frowning, I took out a tissue. White hairs. I wipe them with a finger and leave behind a smudge. Oh, fudge. Soap and water should do the trick. Carefully, I pick up the glass, trying not to leave any prints. Just the bare men. Gently, I lay it in a tub of soapy newspaper. Before anything else can happen, I shut it behind glass doors to save it from dirt, from scratches, from shattering. Now admire it from a distance. I don't think I should use it. It could get dirty, or worse, scratched. It has to be perfect. From a distance, I see something. Something that <laughs> And the last one. Pins and cracks. Silver pins, sliver between Glass, blind eyes, numb touch, bending over shattered glass, crackling cracks, crackling cracks. I trip, I fall full through, sour taste, sharp vinegar, pungent rot, gagging, groping, swallowing gorge. I gasp, I doubt, drop below. Crumbling apart, crumbling in, in, on, over, under, through, myself. Over, under, through, in, under, through, over, tumbled, over, tumbled, over and over, fallen, lost, gone, forgotten, silent, silenced, forgotten, 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 forgotten. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is that uh, audible? Okay. Uh, next we have... a visitor from Germany, a Mr. Krisha, Dr. Krisha Kops, I should say. Uh, he holds a PhD. 
Patricia Kops is uh, part Indian, part German, lives in Germany, and writes in German and in English. He's uh, an author, a journalist, and a philosopher. And uh, he is a, a proclivity for intercultural and global justice-related topics. He studied philosophy and journalism before receiving his doctorate from Hildesheim University. I over to you, Krisha. This poem is as true as any poem can be. And because truth hurts, every word is a notch in my gray bark. Every sentence written with the milky sap on the leaves that I will one day be. This is the poem of an in-between, of the half-half, of the quarter, 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 of the everything and the nothing, how I came from incident to Occident to Orient, how I was able to take root in this place, in this nameless earth, on a border between here and there, on this folded mountain range that grows hour by hour as the continental plates of the subcontinent and Eurasia push against each other to strive towards the sky. This is the holy mountain from which I can overlook almost everything. Times, places, and ways of being. I'm a child of midnight and twilight, a dweller between yesterday, today, and tomorrow by my female, male, and barren blossoms. This is a poem of becoming, of metamorphosis, of death and rebirth, loss and gain. A poem of the self, lest it should forget how it came to be. But this, this poem of the self inevitably consists of other people's poems, of the ancestors which if you follow the branches of the family tree, all lead back to the same trunk. This one here is the poem of us all, a web of aerial roots, some of which have long since buried themselves in the ground while others still dangle in the wind. This is the poem of a boy before he became to who or to what he is. It is the winds, the breath of the gods, that tell me these poems, for I can see many things, but not everything. When they rustle through my leaves and bend my branches, when the clouds rain down upon me, they tell me about what they have seen and heard. They even waft towards me sense of times past, they whisper words that occasionally twist and turn a little on their distant journeys. Words of which they lose one or the other in flight and replace it with one of their own. They are the winds of the east and they are the winds of the west. They swoop by in the form of Vayu, also called Pavana, the breath of God Varuna, as well as Rudra, the one born from Brahma's forehead. They are in all their various forms and manifestations. Vayu, the god of a thousand eyes, sees everything and is as quick as the thoughts of men. Vudra also sees many things with his five heads. He, the god of renewal, the rain bringer. And if not their sons, the Maruts, the clouds and storms whisper to the two winds. They know every single raindrop by its name. Mosam, 
Barish, Barsat, Varshamu, and all the others. Vayu and Rudra do not always agree. Vayu still believes in the goodness of people, even glosses over their stories and poems if need be. Various Rudra is dark like the undersides of his nimbu, nimbus clouds. Hardly anything escapes the clouds and the winds. They sneak through door, gaps, window cracks, chimneys, even seeping through nostrils to hear the whisper of thoughts. Once the nose is blocked, they make their way through ears and mouths. They mix inside and outside, fill and empty lungs, thus turning air into breath. They read the swirls of air that people write into space with their movements, just as they read skin, hair, and scents lingering in the air. So they have done since the beginning of time, swirling and circulating around the earth again and again, in heights and depths, through all the earth's spheres, across all latitudes and longitudes, dissipating and emerging until they sway in my treetop. I like to listen to the winds, for they know no boundaries, neither in space nor in time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, poet in today's uh, listening is Haris Khaliq. Haris is a man of many abilities. He writes in Urdu and he will be in the Urdu Mushaira here also. He writes in English and he has also written in Punjabi a volume of poems. And he's a, gen a columnist, a journalist. He is also the head of the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, and uh, plays his roles there. He has published nine collections of verse and two books of uh, non-fiction. His poetry has been anthologized internationally and translated into several languages. He is a recipient of the President's Award for Pride of Performance. And I give you Mr. Haris Khaliq. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salman Bhai. Um, and I'm very happy to share the panel with you and uh, Guruji Adrian Hussain sitting in the audience. Uh, this is a poem titled Sevan Sharif. Uh, it was written after the bomb blast in Sevan Sharif in 2016. <coughs> with the victims of the bomb blast uh, but then after returning to Islamabad this is what I wrote it was actually 2017 I believe when a suicide bomber targeted uh, the Sufi shrine of Lal Shabazz Kalandar it has 12 parts 12 small parts but I'm not going to say one two three four I'll just read it out to you Sevan Sharif, the shrine, stretches its arms into the sky. Sun sets late on the door. Guidance for where to burst. Sun keeps the tight, tawny skin of his disciple wet. Globules of sweat spread like carbuncles. When they drop on the sand, they turn into pearls. Poor women, men, hasten, pick them up, store in shanty huts. 
between the arcs of her feet and a potter's wheel, a world waits to be born. The cracks in her heels are filled with mud. She dances to the beat of the dhamal. The mud hardens, turns gray. Thick metal anklets banging against each other when he walks. He sells threads, talismans, for feeble wrists, slender collarbones, deep eyes, dream of a past. He's among them, scarred faces, charred souls, tramp and knave, seeking forgiveness, gathering round the funnel, hanging high from a post at the tomb. Someone brings water from the pond, passes it through the funnel, drunk from the hollows of hands. The crooked lines of his palms are straightened, sore mounts softened. She herds a goat, pulling at the limpia to the entrance of the shrine. She collects tassels, adorns the goat, a braid with bells for herself. Her lower jaw is wider, molars thinner, a smell of urine, person and human, a young bride she miscarried. The midwife punctured her, made fistulas. After years, a doctor camped near the village. She escaped. Content with the smells sharpened by the heat of summer. The toes are twisted, legs roped. Neck has green veins bursting out. Teeth pale and chipped, nose receding. Boys tell her she's ugly. She knows. She wants to be held by the waist. Told she's fine. She wants to be entered. Soul touched. She comes to the shrine where all become the same. Walloping laughter scares them. On his way to the shrine, in a bus, with broken windows, dust, gravel, thicken his beard. Between catnaps on the highway, he thinks of the indignities soothsaying brings him food, telling fortunes, interpreting omens, pretending to summon spirits of the dead, condemned like necromancers, wizards, sits in a corner, reads hymns from the Psalms holds on to his cross. He enters the shrine, limping on front legs, leaves a stallion with an arched neck, cross, cross shining through his mane. Bare thighs, legs looped, hiding jewels, he shudders. Shrugs off the image, the girl he met in London. Other images fill the space. Camel toe of the neighbor's wife, sweeping the corridors. Whale tail of a friend's sister, stooping over her desk to read write. The shrine gives solace. He sobs. Young women arouse new desires. He, hold the, he holds the railing. Love knocks. She lives far. On the 14th night of the moon, comes to the shrine. Watches the sun beat the drum in the twilight. With each beat, the wind turns to fire. She smiles at memories. Cranky, speckled mother-in-law lashed her each morning. Cactus tongue, my son gifted, wasted seed in a barren tract of land. Red bandana, black shirt, Bold stains of sweat, round armpits, chest. 
before his left eye was gouged out by the dog of the feudal, he went to school, but to no end. An uncle left him at the shrine when mother, father, cattle were carried away by waves of the Indus. The only lines he can read, I am the follower of the brave lion, a free man choosing to be a slave, devotee of the rightly chosen, Ali. It is thought he memorized these lines. He knows he can read. And the last part, when the bomb rips through, rows of God forsaken, columns on which the dome of the tomb rests, observe a moment of silence. Yet the dancers return, chanting names of the 12 infallible men thumping the floor. Thank you. Next, we were supposed to have Shirin Harun, a um, very fine poet in her own right. Shirin is the. is the daughter of Maki Qureshi, whom I regard as the late Maki Qureshi, one of the finest uh, yeah. poets in English that Pakistan has produced, and a cousin of the uh, uh, Hanif Qureshi, the British novelist. Uh, but Shirin can't be with us today. Her husband, Jeeva, as I mentioned, is in hospital and she's with him. Uh, but I have asked Haris to uh, read us a couple of Shirin's poems. <clears throat> this one is called Requiem. Haris. Uh, thank you for very patiently listening to me. And now these are... Um, as Salman Tariq Qureshi Sahib has said, these are poems by uh, Shirin Harun, uh, three short poems. Um, and of course, I can't read like she would have, but um, I'll try to um, sort of read it for her. Entrance. This is, the title is Entrance. Gravel crunches underfoot. As I walk through, the cottage door is open, the table laid with fine bone china, silk and antique lace for Victorian from another age, through a window embrasure, light makes strange patterns on the floor. I'm only imagined, I promise not to disturb the Chinese porcelain or the wild flowers in their basket, the puppy dreaming on the sofa, all your careful decor skillfully arranged. Uh, the next poem is Requiem. I think of Browning's hopeless search room after room, cupboards, alcoves, in a house of nothing. And I lay out your empty breakfast bowl, now cracked. I put it out anyway. Shall rituals keep you alive? Do they fill in gaps? For the dead are only the selfish dead. And warm, what do they know? of all this vacant space. And the last one is titled uh, Fugitive. I wonder who lives in that chocolate box with the wisteria wall floating in wonderland above the city's pall. The wisteria wall is high and green. There's nothing gothic to be seen, except red king and queen. While they wear muslin frocks within, innocent as Alice of the Grins, 
tiresome vanishing. And when they sit down to eat, they drape the teapot, white and neat, in case the dormouse finds this, his feet enough said of those wisteria lives. We have guessed them high and sweet. Outside a dismembered man crawls across a street. This was Shirin Har. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harris. Thank you so much. And uh, our last poet for the day, uh, Adrian, Dr. Adrian Hussain, or Dr. Akbar Hussain, rather, Adrian Hussain. Uh, Adrian is educated in England. He is, uh, holds a PhD in literature from the University of East Anglia, and he himself is educated at Oxford, and also in Switzerland, I forgot to say. Um, he has been, to my mind, one of the most important influences on poets in English in Karachi. When I have spoken before at this forum and others about the uh, forum uh, about the mixed voices that he used to run at his home and where a number of us used to also go there. Many of us refer to him as maestro because of his perfectionism and his no hesitancy. He is a uh, very, very um, <coughs> accomplished, exceedingly accomplished poet. And he has published uh, he, uh, two his thesis on Shakespeare. Also, sorry, but, uh, by coming to poetry, he has won the he won the Guinness Prize in um, well, while he was still at college. College, and his selection of his poems called Desert Album was published by OUP, and he has also published a selection of sonnets titled Italian Window in 2017. He has another collection of novels on it's called Knife of the Tide, waiting for publication. Uh, Adrian, yours. Thank you very much, Salman. <clears throat> I hope I'm audible. Um, the first poem I'll be reading uh, will be is titled Tribute. This is a poem I wrote for a very dear friend, Mrs. Zarinara Zardari. Uh, she was one of the most extraordinary people I have ever come across in my life, and that's saying something very special as far as I'm concerned. This is a tribute to her. She passed away a few months ago, and uh, that was a very sad moment for me, so I wrote this poem. She was quite an amazing woman. I've tried to say as much as I could. Voice still tinkling like glass, fragile yet unbreakable, still there in the hollows of your home, an almost presence riding free of the prayers sent up for you, cocking a snook at those who never knew your grand design, determination to outwit, outdo, or the part you played were made by circumstance to play. The irony, hurt, hidden by the elegant facade, I do apologize. Pages got it's stuck. Having the same problem. No, yeah, it's awful. This page stuff. The pain, sorry, the pain of having to prove a mind larger, heart deeper, and the gift of a grace. The teasing smile, being become an art. Beveled edges of windows, creative cuisine and the just slightly overstated touch of haute société. Words take flight, fictions turn, curl, as blessed 
and blessing. You return to your domain, uncertainties of dawn, half light, flicker, shimmer. Thank you, that was the first poem. I'll have to get my pages in order, otherwise I'll lose my, um, the next page. Sorry about that. This is called um, Soupçon. Um, it's a moment in nature out in the open and um, it was when rain was about to come. This is important because to me, it's, it's the moment of the encounter with the prototype, the aesthetic prototype, when you feel at one with the world. Roll of thunder, vague explosives overhead, wind in the trees, and a push-up bar, and dumbbells, belonging to whom the garden will not say. While tiny feet of rain trip the same space, tireless, over and over. Thank you. That was Soupçon, thank you. Song for Rilke. This is um, a poem which is a strange poem. I hope you'll be able to follow it. It's not all that easy, but um, I hope you'll understand it. It's, um, it's, a, it's, it's, I would have called it tree feeling, but it's called Song for Rilke. As memory returned, the tree shook. Auspices were taken. It was strange how he swayed with the branches, following their faint pendulum motion, how he grew into them, simply, so, sorry, slowly, slowly becoming leaf and bowl. It was where day started in its high window, the instant quivering as it recovered its native deep, dark, green intelligence. This is a poem about, uh, oddly enough, about pigeons. I've compared them, what they do, to uh, this wonderful embroidery in, uh, that, that you, you, they used to produce in Austria, I think, in the, like a couple of centuries ago. It's, it's, um, anyway, I've tried to capture a moment. It is a skill, the way they eat meticulous bills combining speed and precision as they pick close-eyed at each grain of maize, deft, delicate needlework, reminiscent of a finer time, a more genteel setting than moss and slush and water trough provide. Not much is consumed, a few quick sips and then they are gone, short, stout, shadowy, no heads, all wings, convivial beaks at times turned on each other, needle points stabbing artfully, unstopping, threading down, holes in the right place, embroidery finished. Thank you. Yes, this is, uh, I'm afraid that inevitably, Salman was talking about senior citizens. Uh, most of my poems currently are about, uh, I think, old age and death, I'm afraid. So there we are. But anyway, this is a poem called um, Spring Watch. There he was on the patio in the late winter in the tropics, sunning himself with a chill wind blowing, slender rays of sun touching cannas and Easter lilies in the bud, hedge and grass overgrown amid thoughts of loss, silver stolen, bone china and art deco paintings, and hair gone by heredity, when suddenly it came, had come, had stolen in, like a fog, a knowledge, a newness dulling the senses, clouding the mind, folding itself around him, 
shroud-like. There it was, insistent, almost personified, too close, heedless, coming in. Uh, this is a poem titled Collision, which was written, it's an elegy for a wonderfully, wonderful friend, very old friend, who had a terrible accident on New Year's Eve. And uh, he didn't survive, not just the accident, he didn't survive. And that was very tragic because he was a writer, Irshad Abdul Qadir, who um, has written, I think, a couple of novels, or three novels, perhaps, and short stories. And um, he was an extraordinary man, and he, and he didn't want to go. It was terribly sad because he didn't want to go. And, you know, it had to happen. When it did, it was like it was the hand of destiny, or whatever you want to call it. I had to write this because it was one of those compulsions. Collision. Larger than life, more encompassing and real than the several generations, grandchildren, a great-grandchild close on your heels, dogging you. Loved yet taking up space, subtly expelling you, patriarch almost of a biblical kind. Even so, you stayed leagues apart in your own humming world, hovering between a bane and fay, able at will to break away into your recalcitrant, diverse utopias and your last love, fiction. Sorry, one second, one, one second, one second. Sorry, it's not over yet, one second. I've lost my page again, I do apologize. Fiction, sorry. And your last love, fiction. Still not quite a memory, there is pain as well as fear about your going, the sheer manner of it, a sense as of destiny, of a tryst with time, at the turn of the hour, with no kind deity, no providence there, to ward off the unseen, impending car of revelers ushering in their year. The rest is silence. We, sadly, embracing, let you go in a chill wind, where if nothing else, there may be peace and some notional snow. Thank you. Uh, this is my penultimate poem. It's called Crossing. It's about the floods that, that hit us last year. And um, Anyway, this was my experience, my way of telling, to talking about those floods. There was a, this is called crossing. Uh, and when I say crossing, it means much more than, well, anyway, you may, may be able to figure out what I'm trying to say. There was a ceremony once about place, place names, curious, quaint, mattered, produced a living countryside a mobile space beyond the stillness of thorn dotting desert. The village folk, friendly or suspicious in roadside cafes, carping, cavilling, and cattle, and somewhere boys with cement blocks for stumps playing cricket. A goat, air flaps awry, coming close up to a car, and with recognition and no little humor, looking in. One second, sorry, again, page loss. And with no little humor looking in, oh hell, what's happened to this damn page? Excuse me, sorry about that, I do apologize. And with no little humor looking in, place imagining, dreaming, unlettered, ever there, till the smother of a new tongue Invasion of fluid syllables, all moorings gone, a world become water, 
the terrible birth of metaphor. I hope you can talk about that for a minute after this. The seascape is my last poem. It's again about mortality. Um, that is the way it had to be and is. It is passing so quickly, taking breath away with every breath. A friend intent on television in a moment gone, civility and gusto, old world panache, head lolling all the way to hospital. They will surely ask, what became of us, when and how we went, wind blown, sea blown, leaf, grass, trickle of sand, rock, sea anemone, sheer magic of it, eyes agape, heads at half mast, arms fallen. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you, everyone else, for having uh, joined us today and shared poetry, shared our poetry. Thank you. I may mention that there's uh, uh, two more sections with, of English language poetry with this uh, festival. Uh, Ahmed Rashid, the journalist, has, is launching his volume of poetry, and so is uh, and uh, the Iraqi poet, uh, Sinan, uh, Sinan Antoun, has also has a session over the next few days. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>